Anze, Andante, Anin, and welcome to Se Kona Getso. My name is Leanne Simpson, and I'm an instructor and a board member at the Dechinta Center for Research and Learning, and I'm facilitating this series. I'm coming to you from my own territory today, Michisagi Kinishinabeka King. Dechinta's head office is located in the gorgeous territory of the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation, and we would not exist as an organization without their generosity, patience, expertise, and magnificent understanding of their homeland. I would like to welcome you all to this virtual space and thank you for spending your time today with us. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Danande is coping with a harsh and challenging COVID-19 situation right now. And many of the participants in this webinar are under stay at home orders with kids doing online schooling. And so we're definitely thinking of all of those doing care work in the North right now to keep families and communities as healthy as can be. At the Chinta, we are brought together by our care for the land, each other, and our desire to revitalize and practice indigenous ways of knowing and being. The Chinta is dedicated to creating a future of indigenous cultural revitalization through a connection with the land. Through our programs, we strive to create Northern indigenous communities that are radically self-determining, healthy, sustainable, and connected to indigenous knowledge and practices. We aim to ensure that the education we offer is accessible to all community members, including parents, youth, women, and two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, um, intersecting, and um, asexual plus people. We have a mandate to serve the needs of Northern Indigenous populations through education, research, and community programs. We are mandated to deliver Indigenous-centered arts, culture, language, and educational programming in an innovative land-based environment. We have a commitment to build educational capacity and employment opportunities for students and youth in Northern Indigenous communities. We aim to increase the accessibility of land-based programming for school-age youth, young adults, transitioning out of high school and into post-secondary employment and their families. The Sek Gona Getso or Women Are Strong Speaker series is meant to be a spotlight in a celebration of the incredible work Northern Indigenous women are doing as scholars, researchers, parents, artists, activists, and writers. In these pandemic times, it is also meant to be a space of respect and connection of inspiration and affirmation in the North and beyond. I invite all of you to create with me a supportive, kind and respectful environment for our speaker and for all of our participants. We are facilitating a curated question and answer section at the end of the talk. Please type your questions into the Q&A function on Zoom. Mary Rose Sundberg, founder of Goyatico in Dara, translated the names of the series for us, and I'm grateful to Mero for her support and for her audio clip, Masicho. Collective Broadcast is an artist-run collective specializing in live streaming and tech solution for arts organizations and not-for-profits, and they are helping us with the tech side of things today. Sydney Krill made the fantastic posters and is also helping facilitate behind the scenes. Leanne Charlie did the artwork for the posters. Kelsey Wrightson, as always, provided all kinds of support to make this series happen. We're very honored that you were able to join us today. We are recording the webinar and we'll post the webinars on our website in due time. We are very, very honored that our first uh, speaker in the series is the very brilliant Mandy McDonald. Mandy is a high tanner, a facilitator, and a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, where her work focuses on Indigenous governance and land-based learning. 
She is the co-founder and the managing director for Dene Nao, an indigenous innovation collective that strives to foster indigenous leadership skills and values through resurgence-based initiatives. Mandy is Mushkego, Swampy Cree, originally from Manda Zbik, or Churchill, Manitoba, and has resided in Samba Cay for the past 20 years. Her writing has been published in Decolonization, Indigeneity, Education and Society, Northern Public Affairs, and in Visions of the Heart, issues involving Indigenous people in Canada. So thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to pass things over to Mandy now. Miigwech Masicho. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? Aho, niyo to tamatek. Kia tamis gatnawa gagyao. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mandy McDonald, Nitsika Sun, Mandao Tsipi, Gotsinia, uh, Meshkego Nia. I'm Mandy McDonald. I am Swampy Cree from and a member of York Factory First Nation. Uh, thanks for listening in today. I'm here to share with you some ideas I've been thinking about uh, and writing about in the context of Indigenous governance as a field of academia, but also as normative daily or seasonal practices that we engage in throughout our lives. Um, these ideas are informed by my experiences tanning hides with my friends, organizing hide camps, and all the discussions and relations activated in hide camps or hide tanning spaces. Ultimately, I am interested in drawing out governance principles from Indigenous land based practices, and I'm starting with a deep dive into the theory and methodology that I see in hide tanning. High tanning is a lot. Uh, high tanning is labor, art, resurgence, grounded in affects, relationality, and emotional embodied knowledge. It is a Dene and Meshkigo relational practice and land-based pedagogical method for teaching and instilling a way of being or worldview or a way of life. High tanning teaches indigenous legal and governance principles. High tanning camps are land-based education. High tanning is a way of making a sustainable livelihood that not only respects the land as a relation, but also regenerates connection and relationship to land. In some of my other writing, I refer to the resurgence of high tanning as the high tanning movement, which is composed of many different uh, camps and initiatives, many of which I um, don't know anything about or, or haven't been to. High tanning camps center bodies, land, and embodied knowledge. Therefore, the work of this movement, including the theories behind it and produced by it, is an Indigenous feminisms and queer theories intervention into the field of Indigenous governance and Indigenous studies. Facilitating land-based relationships through land-based education is an important part of regenerating Indigenous governance. Land-based education sustains and grows Indigenous governance, ethics, and philosophy. Land-based education in resurging and sustaining Indigenous life and knowledge acts in direct contestation to settler colonialism and its drive to eliminate Indigenous life and Indigenous claims to land. Um, Eve Tuck, Marsha McKenzie, and Kate McCoy use the concept of land education to describe a particularly critical standard for Indigenous land-based education. They write that land education centers um, indigenous epistemological and ontological accounts of land, including indigenous understandings of land, indigenous language in relation to land, and indigenous critiques of settler colonialism. It attends to the constructions and storying of land and repatriation by indigenous peoples, documenting and advancing indigenous agency and land rights. Land education considers the ways in which land is foundational to settler colonialism, which Western models of place-based education do not. So I'm gonna walk you through a bit of the literature review that I wrote for my dissertation proposal. Um, I'll talk a bit about the difference between indigenous law and indigenous governance. 
I'll explain a bit about the differences between uh, Euro Western and Indigenous worldviews and um, then share some critiques uh, from the literature of current Indigenous political institutions. Um, before I move on, I just wanted to clarify that when I talk about high tanning, I'm talking about camps um, and programs, not necessarily, I'm not necessarily referring to people's familial practices and things that they've uh, been doing intergenerationally on their own and in their communities. I'm specifically focusing on land-based programs um, and, and high tanning camps. So what I noticed in the literature, there, there's not really a difference. Uh, sorry if there's legal scholars out there that disagree, but there's not really a difference between Indigenous law and Indigenous governance in practice from within Indigenous perspectives. Typically, an Indigenous scholar with a background in law will uh, frame governance principles of a nation uh, using the terminology of law as a academic field. And then Indigenous scholars with a background in governance or social sciences will frame those very same principles using terminology found within social sciences. But I think within Indigenous worldviews, uh, legal and governance principles are, they're, they're not distinct. So I use law and governance interchangeably uh, for the purposes of my research. I think it makes sense uh, that maybe there's some people out there that disagree, but uh, yeah, I draw from work of uh, Indigenous legal theorists and Indigenous governance theorists. So within Indigenous thought systems, governance is practiced and remade every day. This is different to Western understandings of governance that often separate the personal from the political and relegate the governing power of individuals uh, to voting. The resurgence or regeneration of Indigenous governance and political systems is a goal of many Indigenous people. Uh, Kier Ladner writes this definition, which is one that I like, and there are many out there that I also like, but for example, Ladner writes that within Indigenous intellectual systems, governance is the way in which a people lives best together, or the way a people has structured their society in relationship to the natural world. The everydayness of Indigenous governance means we have agency and power to enact and, recreate, and create governance every day and how we treat others, organize and engage with the world around us. A governance is not just something that governments do or what a board of director does uh, for an organization or you know whatever. Okay, so I put this image from this evaluation conference I attended in Rotorua in New Zealand in 2019 because uh, I learned so much about what ontology and epistemology means by listening to different Indigenous people. Um, there's pe Indigenous people there from Hawaii and uh, Maori people and Indigenous people from all over the world sharing the specific sort of ontological and epistemological principles and uh, ideas and things from their own uh, ways of knowing. And it really helped me understand even what ontology and epistemology mean. I also saw Manu Lani Meyer speak at this conference and I don't remember exactly how she said it, but uh, what I took from it is we don't need to be afraid of, the, of these big words like ontology and epistemology. I used to be really insecure about presenting on my research and using these words because uh, they, are, they are inaccessible, but we can learn them and, and we can master them. And I just put this up here. <laughs> Uh, ontology is a system of thinking, uh, a study of the nature of reality, and epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge. Uh, there might be other academics out there who don't agree with my uh, terms, but I notice that they're often used interchangeably, and these terms are often used interchangeably with Indigenous worldviews, uh, thought systems, or ways of knowing, or ways of being. So I kind of use all those terms a bit interchangeably here. Within Indigenous studies literature, Indigenous ontologies and epistemologies or worldviews are situated as distinct from Euro-Western ontologies and epistemologies. Sean Wilson, for example, writes that within an Indigenous ontology, reality is the set of relationships or sets of relationships. Rather than the truth being something that is out there or external, 
Reality is in the relationships that one has with the truth. Thus, an object or thing is not as important as, as one's relationship to it. Therefore, reality is not an object, but a process of relationships. I use the terms Western thought or worldview to describe a particular way of thinking rooted in Western European philosophies. Western thought is not monolithic or static, but I do not examine the many nuances and complexities of European Western philosophies. That is not my field. Similarly, I use the terms indigenous thought systems and worldviews to refer to the particular ways of thinking of indigenous peoples as explained and written about by many indigenous writers and theorists and people. With the understanding that there are also many nuances and complexities within and between indigenous thought systems. According to many theorists and writers, there are enough fundamental similarities amongst indigenous thought systems and philosophies to apply some concepts like relationality uh, generally. Western and Indigenous thought systems are different enough that Margaret Kovach, for example, asserts that a significant set of struggle for Indigenous researchers will be at the level of epistemology because Indigenous epistemologies challenge the very core of Western knowledge production and purpose. The way we think about bodies, emotions, and relationality is informed by these worldviews. So theories around the role of bodies and emotions in knowledge production or indigenous knowledge production specifically are implicated in high tanning. In order to understand this, it's important to understand how Western thought and enlightenment rationalism have discursively separated the mind from the body and the human from nature, because it is this colonially imposed thought system that many indigenous peoples are trying to unlearn via the implementation of land-based initiatives. So in her paper on Hawaiian epistemology, Manilani Meyer writes, the truth is Hawaiians were never like the people who colonized us. If we wish to understand what is unique and special about who we are as cultural people, we will see that our building blocks of understanding, our epistemology, and thus our empirical relationships to experience is fundamentally different. We simply see, hear, feel, taste, and smell the world differently. Uh, that, uh, Western worldviews and Indigenous worldviews are so different is what makes evaluation or program evaluation so challenging. And this challenge is even further complicated by the fact that even though these worldviews are situated in the literature as distinct, uh, they are very much entangled uh, in practice. So there's three main differences between Indigenous and Western thought systems articulated in the literature that it are particularly relevant to my uh, research project. Uh, and they, these differences can be dualistically sort of framed as relational, individual, nature, human, and body mind. Within indigenous thought, thought systems, knowledge is relational, humans are not separate from nature, and the mind is not separate from the body. Within Western thought systems, knowledge is individuated, humans are separate and superior to nature, and the mind is separate from and superior to the body. Leroy Little Bear uh, writes this about indigenous thought. Prior to the arrival of Europeans on the North American continent, Native Americans were organized into nations with group life ways that resulted in philosophies, customs, values, beliefs, and governance systems arising from Native American paradigms. These paradigms consist of and include ideas that there is constant flux or motion, that all of creation consists of energy waves, that everything is animate, that everything is imbued with spirit, that all of creation is interrelated, that reality requires renewal, and that space is a major referent. <clears throat> it's important to note that not only are these worldviews different, but the violent colonization of indigenous peoples and lands is largely the result of these distinct worldviews clashing. Little Bear argues that one of the problems with colonialism is that it tries to maintain a singular social order by means of force and law, suppressing the diversity of human worldviews. Uh, Brendan Hokovitu writes, in part, white colonial patriarchy affected colonization because it claimed to emb embody the power of reason and consequently universal interests. 
key to enlightenment rationalism and its reliance on reason to know and to authenticate the objective world was its faith in the mind-body dichotomy orated by Plato and canonized by Descartes. Enlightenment philosophers located the indigenous being in the realm of the physical and irrational, a site that denied full humanity itself. Furthermore, the embodied practices of indigenous epistemologies challenged that knowable, knowable world, and as a result, the reason of enlightenment rationalism. Indigenous knowledges do not align with enlightenment rationalism, so they are positioned as unintelligible and incomprehensible to Western thought, and thus illegitimate and not valid. Oh, those are just a bunch of references for this next section. Okay, foundation of this project is a huge body of indigenous feminist theory critiquing indigenous political institutions, Indian Act regimes and band council regimes, arguing that these institutions are copies of colonial institutions founded in patriarchy and heteronormativity. One of the implications of this argument, and I'm not gonna get into it into too much depth here, but the implication has to do with what I said earlier or just now about Western and indigenous worldviews. If our current indigenous political institutions replicate colonial governance structures grounded in colonial values and Western worldview, the implication is that they're also grounded in this mind-body split that alienates embodied knowledge and the land. That means things like femininity, emotions, bodies, and land are, are considered irrational and not valued within these governance and legal systems. High tenant camps are spaces where indigenous women are regaining their roles in governance and law. A common indigenous feminist critique of our political institutions, both the indigenous ones and non-indigenous ones, is that they don't do enough to address violence, especially violence against women. High tanning camps are an example of indigenous women attempting to relationally reorient themselves and their communities to the land. High camps <clears throat> may not explicitly address physical violence against indigenous women, but they are a type of harm prevention. Camps are designed to be free of violence, including lateral violence, and such violence is directly addressed if it is noticed in the camp. Camps are considered harm prevention because they facilitate the development of support networks and friendships. They empower camp participants to relearn their language and cultures and to reconnect to land and community. Rauna Kwakinen argues that indigenous self-determination is a foundational value that fosters the norm of integrity manifested in two central forms, integrity of the land and individual integrity, including freedom from bodily harm and violence. Furthermore, she argues that indigenous feminist examinations of self-determination calls for transformation centered on reorientation to the land, not simply adding women's perspectives to mainstream discourse on self-determination. Indigenous self-determination requires a relational reorientation to land that explicitly addresses violence against the land and indigenous people's bodies. Indigenous self-determination cannot materialize or be exercised without restructuring all relations of domination. The research participants involved in her project on Indigenous self-governing institutions in Canada, Greenland, and Scandinavia were mostly Indigenous women not involved in formal, not involved in formal political institutions. The findings of this project demonstrate that the Indigenous self-governing institutions are characterized by gender regimes similar to Western political institutions, and that existing models and structures of indigenous self-government are a form of structural violence in their exclusion of indigenous women and their conception of self-determination. The realities that colonization and colonial policies like the Indian Act, for example, yielded for indigenous women are very, very well documented. Indigenous writers and theorists have shared their lived experiences and felt knowledge about settler colonialism while also providing critical analyses of how the removal of women from leadership roles has impacted Indigenous governance and political systems. Kuokunin writes, Indigenous women's own self-determination has been contested and denied first by patriarchal colonial law, 
policies and institutions, and later by indigenous men who have internalized and adopted the norms and values of patriarchal colonialism. As a result, indigenous women's rights or the responsibilities to their territories have been erased. Even though indigenous women were displaced from their communities and from leadership roles, many relocated and contributed to building robust, vibrant indigenous communities in urban areas by creating organizations that provided services and cultural programming for indigenous people. And just to reiterate, this is all part of a literature review. Uh, this is not much of my own. I didn't add much to this. The reason I'm including it here is to demonstrate that our current political institutions are probably, are probably not going to regenerate our thought systems for us. They may do good work in other areas like providing services and material benefits and administration and stuff, but they will not regenerate our philosophies and thought systems and knowledges, specifically if we're not involved. And uh, we have to figure out ways to do this work outside of these systems. The, the nature of embodied knowledge means that you actually have to participate in the embodiment process by doing the practice or engaging in whatever the knowledge or teaching that you're trying to access and internalize. The theoretical work of considering what kinds of relations promote the value of self-determination combined with the work of creating and implementing opportunities where these relations can be fostered and the critical self-reflection required to negotiate for power, space, and resources to do this work is the contribution of the high tanning movement to indigenous self-determination and governance theory today. Gina Starblanket and Heidi Stark claim that while being committed to the regeneration of a relational way of being is relatively straightforward at a theoretical level, enacting this commitment in our day-to-day -day lives gives rise to many complex questions and contradictions. While I agree with that, uh, the only way to foster a relational way of being and to address the complex questions that they refer to is via messy praxis of which the high tanning movement is an example. And by praxis, I mean theory, action, self-reflection, all in one word. The movement is realigning social relationships to overcome the damage inflicted by policies like the Indian Act while, facil while also facilitating a relational reorientation to land that is inherently and expressively anti-violent. All right, now I'm gonna talk a bit about my project. <clears throat> Indigenous theorists today are challenged to not only identify and articulate indigenous knowledge and theory, but to actively regenerate and live it. This task is riddled with complexities and ethical concerns because indigenous thought systems are dynamic and fluid while also deeply entangled with Western thought systems and constrained by settler colonialism. In response to this challenge, uh, this project will, I hope, explore the work of an informal collective or network of predominant, predominantly but not exclusively Indigenous women who are regenerating Indigenous thought and political systems through high tanning. It explores contemporary high tanning initiatives amongst Indigenous people in order to document the knowledge being generated in these spaces, the implications of this knowledge, and how this knowledge is and can be practically applied outside of high tanning camps. And the way I'm kind of framing it right now is uh, through kind of a lens of an indigenous evaluation. I argue now based on my own lived experiences that high tanners are regenerating and embodying indigenous governance, the principles of which could be applied to political organizing and political institutions. These governing practices are about organizing transnationally, sharing knowledge transnationally, sharing authority over land, and most importantly uh, for me, how to creatively facilitate relational knowledge generation in diverse spaces. This knowledge is valuable because it demonstrates the type of political organizing, visioning, and theory making that occurs outside of Indian Act regimes 
and other indigenous political institutions born of colonial and patriarchal ideals. Okay, this is the fun part. This is the fun part of my presentation. <clears throat> there is a <clears throat> critical thread pulling through the discussions of epistemology, land-based education, indigenous feminisms, and governance, uh, which is the role of bodies as producers of valuable felt knowledge. Locating emotions as knowledge produced by bodies is a challenge to Western thought and the principle of objectivity. Felt theory includes what Diane Millian calls affective discourses and felt or embodied knowledge. In the context of my proposed research, felt knowledge includes intuition about how to handle conflicts and safety concerns in a camp, feelings of community belonging, longing and connection, and how feelings like these and others that are instilled in camp settings reverberate in other spaces and experiences. Indigenous epistemologies locate feelings and emotions as felt knowledge. Uh, for example, Manu Lani Meyer uh, explains, in her explanation of Hawaiian epistemology uh, says this, intelligence is found in the core of our body system in our viscera, the na'au. For mentors, it is the feeling of something that constitutes part of knowing something. Gregory Kehete writes, we learn through our bodies and spirits as much as through our minds. While bodies have been situated by indigenous theorists as producers of knowledge, the articulation of felt theory is an indigenous feminist intervention. Millian argues that indigenous women's felt scholarship is segregated as feminine experience, polemic or illegitimate knowledge. Other disciplines have also addressed emotion, some arguing that emotions have gotten too little attention in academia and that it is virtually impossible to document human emotions. However, affective discourses or narratives like the works of Lee Miracle, Jeanette Armstrong and Maria Campbell are uniquely indigenous feminist contributions to felt theory and knowledge sharing more broadly. <clears throat> Um, so I recently read an article by Darcy Lindbergh called uh, Neo Nehiya Weiwin or Beautiful Kareenis Ceremonial Aesthetics and Nehiya Legal Pedagogy, uh, which resonated with this project so strongly. Lindbergh's article is about drawing out Nehiya legal norms and pedagogy from ceremonial practices, specifically the sweat lodge ceremonial practices. I think a similar analysis could be applied to high tanning norms and practices, which is one of the things I'm most interested in. I quote this article at length. <clears throat> As in many other indigenous societies, law constellates within the Hiyo Pematsuin or Cree way of life from many locations. It is found in dreams, dances, art, the land and nature and found in how people live their lives. It is written on our hearts. It is passed down through elders and families and is recorded in stories, songs, and customs. Legal capacities, relationships, and obligations are contained in narrative practices, rituals, and conventions. While it is normal to describe Indigenous laws like this, there is a tendency to shy away from describing non-Indigenous legal orders in this similar way. He goes on to write that Western legal theory has degraded the legitimacy of laws sourced from the land, uh, which aligns with what I shared earlier about Western thought systems and the ways in which they um, invalidate uh, the land and bodies and feelings. He explains that Western law is dominated by the belief that law should be closely related to a society embedded in a rhythm of industrial production. The continued movement of legal systems towards technical efficiency has created a new aesthetic of Western legal systems that is industrial and decontextualized. Lindbergh describes aesthetics as the spectrum of sensory experiences ranging from the limited sensuality of black letter law to full sensory experiences like the sweat lodge ceremony. Beauty describes persuasive aesthetics that draw individuals towards the sensory experience. Nahiu law is often meant to be practiced beautifully in order to convey its persuasive authority, Lindbergh writes. Uh, the shared processes within Nahiu law require participants to embody law, 
act in harmony with other participants, call through melody for others to participate, and deepen our relationships with each other through sensual experiences of law. The idea of the sensory experience and the role of aesthetics in knowledge transmission is a really important point I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute and talk a bit about uh, Laura Chucho's master's paper on Etzela or Dene love songs. Um, Laura Tucho wrote her MA thesis on uh, Dene love songs. Uh, it's called Etzela, the language is like Etzela. Um, and it's such a rich and beautiful account and analysis of Dene love songs. This is another example of the role of aesthetics in knowledge transmission and embodied knowledge transference. Um, Lindbergh writes about a process through which knowledge becomes embodied via the sweat lodge. He writes that ceremonies offer an embodiment of law. And so too, I say, does land-based practices like high tanning and singing and learning Dene love songs. Well, my research is on high tanning, the legal or governance principles it transfers and the knowledge embodiment process. I also wanted to share a bit about Tucho's MA thesis because it's such a beautiful example of the aesthetics of Dene law and uh, governance knowledge transmission. Contemporary high tanning practices such as high tanning camps can also be understood through a lens of ethical love and indigenous relational aesthetics. Drawing from Bell Hooks and uh, Leanne Simpson, Yas Morgan writes, ethical love is a pedagogy of relationality taught to indigenous peoples by their kin, siblings, aunties, grandparents, and other individuals of influence. And activated, it's animated self through attentiveness to kinship responsibilities. Ethical love, being in a good way with all creation, is something that is learned by feeling, doing, being, building, and even destroying by enacting relations with oneself and the surrounding world. Morgan also writes that indigenous relational aesthetics describes the relational ways of making art encoded within indigenous epistemologies, which aligns with high tanning because the practices of high tanning are encoded with many teachings, values, relationships, and stories. And these teachings, values, relationships, and stories are actually also encoded into every other element of a high tiny camp from the food that's prepared, how waste is disposed, where we sleep, what and how we harvest and how we care for each other. Emotional embodied knowledge like ethical loves drives high tanning praxis. Uh, similar to the sweat lodge ceremony, high tanning is an immersive sensory experience that offers the transmission of embodied knowledge of legal governance norms. The aesthetics of high tanning, that is the immersive full body sensory experiences of high tanning, draws people in to then learn the law and governance norms of that nation or community. This idea is very intuitive if you're a high tanner or if you hang out at high camps. There might be a bunch of high tanners out there listening, which would be cool if you want to say something later. There is a concern applied, there's a concern implied within this analysis. There's lots of implications for everything that I just said, but one thing I'll focus on is that the aesthetics of a camp won't necessarily be the same across all camps and high tanning experiences. You actually need to be thoughtful about the type of experience you facilitate for participants as a camp organizer. I'm not just referring to the physical safety of participants, which includes considerations about food, food safety, staying warm and dry, bears or other animals and emptying outhouses and honey buckets. I'm talking about the emotional, mental and spiritual safety of participants, which means being thoughtful about accessibility, uh, LGBTQ and two-spirit identities and how violence, including lateral violence, uh, could be addressed in camps. All of these have major impacts on the aesthetics, the sensory experiences in a camp. This is extremely important because the sensory experience is how Indigenous knowledge is transferred. So if you're facilitating a situation where Indigenous people there feel excluded or attacked or unwanted or scared, 
you're failing the knowledge transmission process and people are slipping away unnecessarily, in my opinion. This means not only being sensitive and accommodating to different positionalities, but having the strength and the courage and the established relationships to address conflict, trauma, distressing emotions, and things like homophobia and transphobia on the land. I'm thinking, I'm thinking specifically right now in this case about two-spirit queer and trans Indigenous people and youth because there are so many gendered expectations around uh, land-based practices that um, I think require more self-reflection and, and thought generally in some cases. Okay. So the high tanning movement is generating knowledge about contemporary indigeneity, relationality, and law and governance. There's a gap in academic literature on methodologies for Indigenous-led research on Indigenous land-based programming, especially with regards to evaluation. Evaluation is important, mundane as it may sound. We can't just drop a bunch of people off in the bush and expect the land to just fix all our problems. Neither do we need a rigorous evaluation to really know that spending time on the land is good for many of us. However, we typically have limited resources and time to invest in land-based programs, both as learners and as program providers. So we want to make our programs as effective and safe and inclusive as possible, which thoughtful evaluation can assist us in doing. Uh, as a programmer, I've heard many people express aversion or even disdain to structure, including schedules and assigned responsibilities and things, are arguing that structure is a colonial imposition, implying that Indigenous peoples didn't have or need structure on the land, which is uh, preposterous. Indigenous peoples always had systems and structures uh, which were grounded in long-term intergenerational consensual relationships to land. And we are trying to relearn these systems through land-based programming. We should be figuring out the best systems and structure for delivering the highest level of quality in land-based programming. And that's why we should probably invest some thought and rigor into indigenous evaluation in this area, because Western models of, ev of evaluation, I think generally are irrelevant and you know, too linear and I never really resonated with me or any of the programs that I was a part of. The structures, systems and best practices and theory generated by the high tanning movement are valuable gifts to the field of indigenous studies, indigenous political organizing and activism more broadly and indigenous land based programming. Uh, a thoughtful indigenous evaluative approach would assist us in articulating and sharing these contributions. Okay, so the title of my talk, in conclusion, the title of my talk is Regenerating Indigenous Governance Theories in High Tanning. And if it's not already clear, let me reiterate what I mean. Groups who organize high camps are recreating the context through which our knowledges are activated, especially embodied knowledge of law and governance. What I want to do is draw out and articulate these principles by theorizing with other high tanners, especially high tanners who take on the tremendous labor of organizing camps and facilitating these spaces for others to access this knowledge. I hope that in taking on this work, we might be able to apply these legal and governance principles to some of the very challenging issues uh, we experience um, around justice and violence in our communities. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mandy. That was, um, that was amazing talk. And one of the things that was really, really clear to me um, from listening to you speak is how much time um, you've spent high tanning and how much time you've spent um, in groups, either in urban settings or in the bush, collectively high tanning. And I think that all of that um, embodied sensory knowledge that you've gained 
um, through participating in those land-based activities is so clear in your research. And that's really, really beautiful. I'm wondering if you could speak um, just a little bit about how you came to be a high tanner and how um, for, for folks in the audience who might be wondering how to, um, how to participate in, in high tanning, um, can you speak to just how, how that, uh, that happened for you personally? Sure. So I started learning in 2010 from Mila Nakeko, and she was doing a project called the Golo Day Project, where she was, she was sought out to learn a uh, high tanning from different high tanners in the dead show. And we became friends and she let me tag along. So that's kind of how that started. And, you know, I used to always think like, oh, like, why are people, why are, why are people so into it? It's like, I know I'm into it, but it's this like persuasive aesthetics thing that I mentioned before, because me and Mila started working together, uh, our friend and hi, then it, Mila and Tanya are high tanning instructors with Danny Nowo. We started working together in 2011, more and more people. We were kind of trying to identify people that would teach us. And it kind of started off that way. Um, and so I don't know if advice, like it, it feels weird to be like, hey, I know you know a skill, can I like learn with you? But I think people like appreciate that when they know, when they really know something, they kind of want to share it, I think, in a lot of ways. So we, we, we organize, Danny Nouveau organize, organizes camps but so does lots of other places now. Like I just saw on uh, social media, there's a Casca a Hyde camp just um, winding down. Uh, there's one, I think, in Fort Good Hope. Like there's the Little K Women's Group Annual Hyde Camp that has been happening since 2014. Uh, there's, there's more opportunities out there than I think people uh, might realize to learn this. <clears throat> Awesome. Um, so one of the things I really liked about your work is how you're really highlighting um, how the experience of Hyde Camp on a sensory level is really important for the transmission of Indigenous knowledge. And we have a question from the very amazing Sage Paul. Um, Sage would like to hear more about your view on lateral violence and addressing conflict in Western institutions through indigenous governance, which can get tangled up in cultural bullying or Western legal terms. Sage also says, thank you so much for sharing your research and all the work that you do. It's beautiful and brilliant. It builds a huge sense of belonging and grounds, my own accountability in working with and for our communities and beyond. So can you just talk a little bit more about your view on lateral violence and conflict and how, um, how we can address those issues using things like high tanning and indigenous governance? Sure, so I do write about this in my bigger, like some other stuff. And what I think has been the most effective in addressing lateral violence, well, there's lots of different ways, right? But I think modeling is super important when you're running a camp. And I, you know, it's funny in um, outdoor, outdoor education and like outdoor guiding industry talk about modeling, but we also see it from our elders so, so clearly. Like when we, when we, the elders that we work with, um, I'm thinking right now of the late uh, Judy Lafferty, like see, and, and many others and seeing how they are, like they're just their ways of being. They don't gossip, they don't like complain about stuff. They're really nice, they're really gentle, they're so kind. And then trying to like copy that way of being. I find when you're running a camp, people look to you as an authority figure almost and problematic as that don't, that may be um, modeling the that kindness and gentleness and like respect for camp participants I think goes like really really far and then but you know sometimes a violence manifests in kind of more aggressive ways which then you need a different approach but um I, I do find that the modeling thing, like we're really conscious about it at Dede Nouveau. We talk about it with the staff before camp and uh, 
yeah, that's sort of my approach to it. I don't know if that's helpful for you, Sage. But hi, Sage. Sage was uh, at our Banff High Tiny Residency. Awesome. I think the other um, really, really brilliant part of your presentation was talking about how, I, I guess the term messy praxis, that really resonated with me um, because things can get so messy when we're doing this kind of decolonizing work, when we're doing it together, when we're doing it on the land. And I liked how you were using that to mean theory, action, embodiment, self-reflection all at the same time. Um, can you maybe talk a, a little bit about how you you came to that that term and that understanding? Sure. I think about all the things that I wish I had done a little bit differently over the past 10 years of land-based programming, <laughs> because like, we don't, you know, we don't always know what the right thing is to do in all cases. Try to talk to everybody, like be really transparent about decision-making and address things as the best way you can. You know, we always have um, amazing elders on all of our programs that when things come up, try to talk to them, but it's, it's all, it's never clear like what to do all the time. And so you just have to make a decision and do something and it doesn't always work out the best, but then you kind of know better for next time. So you do kind of need a bit of a, like resiliency is very valuable in these cases because lots of times make a decision, do something. And it probably wasn't the, like, it definitely wasn't the best, but it was the best based on what you knew at the time, perhaps. And then people are mad after at you and you have to kind of figure out all your relationships, uh, maintenance during that time as well, and try to keep everyone together. Uh, and then like move on and just do your best after that again. Yeah, I think that that really resonates um, with my own experience in, in land-based education. And so that's really affirming and helpful, helpful to hear. I'm so excited about your dissertation and, and about your work. What's what's next for you? When when can we when can we read your book? Hmm. Well, I just defended my proposal in August and I've been taking a little break since then. And uh, yeah, so I don't know, hopefully in within the next two years, it'll be done. Awesome. Well, Masi Cho, Miigwech, thank you so much for sharing your, your presentation and your brilliance with us today and for being the very first speaker in our series. Um, we've recorded Mandy's talk today. Um, lots of people are asking that and we will get that up on our website at dechinta.ca as soon as we can. Um, our next speaker in this series is taking place on October 26th at 12 noon Yellowknife time and the speaker is Leanne Charlie. Leanne will be speaking uh, about the moose and northern Toshone governance in the making. So that sounds like an amazing follow-up to Mandy's presentation and we hope that everybody can come back and, and join us. So thank you so much, Mandy. Thank you so much, um, everyone that, that spent their, their noon hour with us. And I, I hope to see you all soon in person. And I hope to see you back here at the end of October for Leanne's presentation. Have a really good day and stay safe. Bye now.